Hello, I hope you're well. Welcome or welcome back to my channel and welcome to my April reading vlog slash dragonfly and amber vlog. So I feel like there has been a ton of excitement in the Outlander universe or the Outlander fandom, whatever the official name is. I don't know it, although I belong to it, but basically every few weeks this like late winter, early spring, there has been another fantastic like thing that happened because <laughs> I can't use words. But like in February, season six of the TV show went into production and it had been delayed because of COVID like so much else. And then in March, they announced that it had been renewed for a season seven. So there was going to be more of the TV show, which was also exciting. And then like last week, the last week of March, Diana Gabaldon posted on her Twitter feed that she had finished writing Go Tell the Bees That I Am Gone, which is the next book in the series. She really made a valiant effort to try to manage the expectations of when this book would be published, although her fans are rabid and it ended up not being so successful. So she kept saying that she has no control over the publication date. She doesn't know when the publication date is. It's all up to the publishers, but basically just being like, patience, everyone. This isn't coming out immediately. However, I am of the opinion that the publishing world is going to fast track this bad boy as much as humanly possible because they're almost guaranteed a bestseller here and publishing likes that money. They really like that money. So I feel like they really are going to try to fast track this thing. But what this means is that me, who had set the rather ambitious goal to read the other eight books this year, needs to kind of pick up the pace, okay? Because I want to be able to read the ninth book when it is published. Like, I want to be one of those people that gets it the day it's out and reads it. That is my goal. But that means I still have seven books to read. And that is where this reading vlog comes in. So I'm going to be chronicling my reading of the second book in the series, Dragonfly and Amber, which is roughly 945 pages long. So it's going to be quite a big one. Um, but yeah, this is what this vlog is going to be about. I can't promise that it is going to be spoiler free. In fact, I have a very sneaking suspicion that it won't be. I also have a sneaking suspicion that I will be ugly crying on camera at some point during this process. I haven't read the book before, but I have seen the TV series and I know what to expect. So. This is going to be soul crushing and devastating and I feel like people are here for that. People like seeing people suffer on booktube when it comes to reading vlogs. So we're gonna go with that. Welcome to the chaos, okay? <laughs> Talk to you later, bye. Okay guys, the read is on. Started this this morning, got through part one of Dragonfly and Amber. And before I go any further in this video, a couple of reminders or notes, I guess, more than reminders, except the first one is a reminder. So firstly, there will be spoilers in this vlog. So if you're not interested in knowing what happens in the book right now, I'd suggest saving this video to your watch later and coming back to it after you read the book. Um, the the second thing is that yes, I will be annotating my copy of Dragonfly and Amber, which is what I do with the majority of the books I read these days. And lastly, I just want to show off my stunning new bookmark, which I am so obsessed with and I hope this focuses, but if it doesn't, my apologies, but it's absolutely stunning. And so I'm just going to put this back in my book, um, but yeah. Where am I? So as I said, I read part one of Dragonfly and Amber early this morning. It's now like 637 in the evening. So I have had time to 
think and ponder. So the book starts in 1968, which is an interesting choice in my opinion because it gives away something but also doesn't give away anything at the same time. The thing that we know that it gives away is the fact that Claire at some point has traveled back to her present because the last time we saw Claire she was with Jamie and that was in 1744. So we are 200 plus years later, right? Okay, so we know that, but we don't know why Claire came back and we don't know necessarily what happened to, Dr to Jamie straight off the bat. What we do know is that Claire has returned to Inverness with a very tall red-headed daughter who is about 20 years old. And we have a sneaking suspicion that she is Jamie's child from the jump. And Claire kind of alludes to it at some point and then Roger, who is this historian that comes into play because he is entrusted by Claire to do some research on warriors from Culloden, he kind of figures out that Brianna's parentage is a little murky. He doesn't know how, and it's not until like the very end of the section that Claire kind of confesses it all that Jamie Frazier is Brianna's father and that she had traveled back in time. Like she eventually gets there, but it's because she's found Jamie's grave and it scares the crap out of her and it's like she's seen a ghost and she kind of loses it and just divulges everything like word vomit. Um, <laughs> and the like crazy thing is when she's talking about it and you have literally Roger and Brianna like trying to get her to sit down in the shade, like lay down, have a drink of water. She makes this remark about how like back in 1744 people assumed she was a witch. Nowadays people think she's crazy and that she needs a psychologist and it was just like so spot on as far as an assessment and very very self-aware because obviously in book one she had been tried as a witch when she was in the 18th century. So that was kind of, it was kind of fun. Um, and I liked, I liked that moment. There was something about it. But yeah, so that's where we are as of right now. I am enjoying it, but I'm also at the point where I'm like, okay, let's get back to the main story. Like, let's get back to the 18th century. I want Jamie. I don't want dead Jamie who's been in the ground for 200 plus years. I want like flesh, blood, Jamie with the gorgeous accent and the kilt and all the steam and all of that. Like I'm ready for Claire to be loved up by Jamie, especially because at this point the only like whiff of Jamie we have had is Claire having a rather hot dream that wakes her up in the middle of the night. So I'm ready for the passion, I'm ready for the love, I'm just ready for Jamie who is my dream man, okay? So that's where we stand. I don't think I'm gonna read any more tonight, but I'm looking forward to beginning part two tomorrow because it starts in 1744, so we're back to picking up where we left off with book one. And that means Jamie will be there and I'm excited. Hello, checking in as I've literally just put down Dragonfly because it is time for me to adult as much as I don't want to today, but reading update. So last night I left you saying that I really wanted a hot-blooded Jamie to make an appearance and he did within the first few pages of part two basically um and i have no regrets none whatsoever the steam the smut i am here for it jamie is my man so i was pleased although it did make for an interesting 6 30 reading I'll, I'll give you that much um <laughs> but we are currently in france where Jamie and Claire are basically getting themselves situated to help thwart 
this Jacobite Rebellion and Bonnie Prince Charlie's plans and all of that. Um, so it's really very much laying the scene. Claire is pregnant, which we knew from how book one ended. Um, Jamie is still an outlaw and they're still getting into a lot of trouble. Claire has already made a new enemy who has already threatened her life and Jack Randall, Black Jack, literally just made an appearance as I put down the book. So the fact that I have to work now and can't actually continue on reading is a bit of a bummer. But we thought Black Jack was dead. He is not dead. He is not dead. Just, just lots of trouble. But I guess that's what you look for in these books. Like, what sort of book would you really have if the hero and heroines were just like sitting at home knitting sweaters? Like, they have to get into trouble. It's just that they seem to get into trouble all the time. If it's not Jamie, it's Claire. And if it's not one of them, it's both of them together. And you just, you just gotta let it run its course and cringe and be terrified for them. And so, yeah, that's kind of where we are right now. As I said, bummed that I actually have to stop reading currently so that I can adult, but that is life. I'm going to go work. I will hopefully check in with you later today if I get to do some more reading. If not, I will check in with you tomorrow. False alarm, friends. Not Jack Randall. Literally just read the first page of the next chapter. Somewhat relieved but needed to report back. I'm going to go back to reading now. Okay, okay, bye. We know Jack Randall. Okay. Okay, we're back. Um, don't have a ton of time this morning because today is kind of a big day at work, but I wanted to check in since I literally gave you like a 30 second check in very, very early this morning. Um, today is a very busy day, as I just mentioned. One of the awards programs that I run for work closes for submissions today, so I'm basically in meetings from 9 until 11, and then I will be logged in for work until midnight tonight. So it is a very, very long day, and I plan to get myself some wine and have sushi for dinner and treat myself. But I did manage to read a little bit more of Dragonfly this morning, as you will have seen from my very shocked and brief clip. I don't know why that shocked me as much as it did, because I watched the TV show, but apparently I don't remember a lot of it from the first two seasons. I actually kind of liked this section that I read. It gave me a lot of like things to think about and ruminate on. So Jamie and Claire are kind of settling into their new life. You're seeing more of the people from the French royal court. Um, you're seeing Jamie kind of doing his espionage spy thing. Um, and you see him nearly getting himself offed in <laughs> and narrowly escaping with some humor. Um, just a, a lot of like fun things going on. The two, there were kind of two things that really stuck out to me in this and got me thinking. And the first was Frank, Frank Randall. So Frank Randall is Claire's husband in her present. So in the 20th century in the 1940s. Basically when she thinks she saw Jack Randall, who is the 200 year old doppelganger, for Frank. It kind of dredges up these feelings in her and she ends up having a dream about Frank where Frank is teaching a history lecture of some sort and kind of looking at the artifacts of daily life from people living their lives in the past and he's talking about kind of the minutia and how much you learn from these objects which is interesting and from a historian standpoint, I was geeking out a little bit. Um, but then he has these two miniature portraits and one is of Jamie and one is of Claire. And she kind of wakes up sobbing and, and like Jamie says that she was calling out his name. And now I have this whole theory about Frank. Essentially, I don't think that Claire is 
really in love with Frank. I'm just gonna put that out there in the universe. So I think that the 19 year old Claire that married Frank is very different from the 26, 27 year old Claire who ends up marrying Jamie. Basically, in book one, it explains to you that because of World War II, Claire and Frank spent the better part of like five, six years apart with only a couple like meetings in between them. So they matured into different individuals from the ones that they married. I think their Inverness honeymoon was supposed to be kind of a rekindling and getting to know each other a little better again situation. But there are like warning signs in that honeymoon. Yes, there was a lot of sex, but it's a honeymoon, so what do you expect? But like, they're just not well matched. Like Claire is very open about the fact that basically everything that Frank is passionate about, passionate about when it comes to history doesn't interest her. They don't see eye to eye on kind of the children question because Frank doesn't want to consider adoption, but Claire, who was basically adopted by her uncle Lamb, is open to it if they can't have children of their own. And they have like a little, not a fight, but a disagreement over it on their honeymoon. And then also they both basically accuse each other or have suspicions that the other individual had affairs during their like five, six years apart during the war, which is ironic because obviously Claire goes off and marries someone else. There are like fissures there. It's not as happy a marriage as one would expect. And I don't think she would have fallen so hard for Jamie if she was as in love with Frank as like the idea that she wears Frank's wedding ring this whole time is supposed to lead you to believe in these moments of guilt where she starts thinking about Frank and all of this stuff. I think if I kind of distill it and I do my too long didn't read it synopsis, I basically think that Frank is not actually a person in the sense that he represents what Claire misses about her present life. So he is a personification of her life in the 20th century, which she still kind of holds on to in a number of ways because of her sort of modern woman sensibilities. And obviously she's a modern woman in the 1940s or the 1960s, not in the 21st century. But I think you understand where I'm going. He's an embodiment, a personification of what she's left behind for Jamie. And it's something that she has a hard time letting go. And I think that's what Frank really stands in for, at least in my opinion. Um, so yeah, there was that dream, which was interesting. I did like it. And then there's this other really humorous point um, in the in the book at this moment where Claire is like palling around with the ladies of the court and one of them has her like groomer there and Claire takes advantage of it and she has her legs and her underarms waxed and when Jamie sees the underarms waxed he kind of freaks out <laughs> and um, it was just this really funny moment where it's just like, yeah, Claire, who grew up in the 20th century, would have been more accustomed to women having clean shaven underarms and shaved legs, kind of doing things to remove body hair, which is a lot of what we do now into even larger extents, I think. Um, and so for her, having her underarms sh like waxed makes her feel clean and less smelly and that's su such a like modern 20th century I think feeling and her legs too like she feels sexier and cleaner and all of this stuff because now her legs are nice and smooth and Jamie is just like I don't understand like why would you do this like my hair's my legs are hairier than yours do you mind me like I don't mind that you smell like a woman, like all these just like funny kind of moments that show you just how different their sensibilities are 
because of having been raised in two different eras 200 years apart and it was really fun and it's interesting because it's just not something that I really have ever thought about in a historical fiction um, but is definitely more accurate I think because of my own sort of modern sensibilities even though I'm reading these historical fictions and I'm reading books about women who lived hundreds of years ago I'm not necessarily thinking about the fact that they probably didn't shave their underarms or legs um, or have a lot of the grooming that we do. I think the only thing that really kind of sticks out to me is like, yeah, they don't bathe all that often so they kind of stink. But apart from that, didn't really think about it or consider it and this book kind of because of the scene makes you think about it. But yeah, it was just cute. Um, it was really funny. It's always nice to see Jamie absolutely scandalized by something modern that Claire says and does. I am really enjoying it. I'm kind of bummed that I can't read more this morning, but I do need to start getting ready for work. And to be honest, I don't know that I will get a chance to read more of it this evening either because of everything that I have going on. And yeah, that's that's kind of where we are. I'm hoping during work that I can listen to an audiobook that I've been reading, which is Detransition Baby, which one of my friends had recommended to me. Um, and it's totally different tone because it's contemporary. So that's been a bit of a switch in my head. So hopefully I can get to some of that. Um, and then later this evening when I am clocked on for work, basically from 6 until midnight. I'm hoping that I can edit a little bit of this vlog, maybe work on editing another video, basically anything I can do to keep myself awake. So we'll see. But yeah, that's all I've got for you now. I'll talk to you later. Hello! Checking in. So full disclosure, it has been quite a few days since I checked in with this vlog and also up until this morning I think I had skipped reading for the last four days, not because of a slump, but just because life. So Wednesday I worked from 9 a.m. until 1 a.m. Thursday morning, and I just decided to give myself a lie-in on Thursday, which means that I didn't read, that I just kind of slept in as much as I'm possible and capable of doing, which is not very late, it's like 6.30, and then just kind of watched YouTube videos and watched TV until I had to log in for work, which was fine. But then I got food poisoning Thursday evening, and so I spent Thursday night, Friday, and a good part of Saturday just trying to like recover and being gentle with myself. I don't know if anyone has had food poisoning before, but it's not fun. So I really was just incapacitated. That's that's where I'm gonna leave that and just move into um, all of the updates as far as reading Dragonfly in Amber, which I did, which I did read some of this morning. As I mentioned, I finished part two and then read all of part three. It's interesting because for a little bit of it I was just kind of like this is like a building situation so you know something is going to happen but it's just a lot of pieces kind of falling into place and so I didn't feel as though a ton happened and like the moment I said that Diana Gabaldon was like, hold my beer. Um, and things started to happen in rapid succession and I was like, oh crap, okay, great, 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 great. We had a lot of like, in this section, a lot of surprise appearances. Dougal was one, but the biggest one was actually Jack Randall making an appearance. Like that was a huge one because as you will have seen in an earlier clip, I thought he had appeared, but it was actually like his relative, Alex, who I think is a brother, who looks a lot like Jack Randall. So there's a very, very strong resemblance in this family, apparently even in the same generation. And then, yeah, that, that was not a good moment for Jamie, I have to say. And then I think one of the most like heartbreaking scenes 
which is basically Claire begging Jamie not to kill Jack Randall because if he kills Jack Randall now, then Frank won't exist. And she is, her logic is that if he kills Jack Randall now, he is killing an innocent person because he's not allowing Frank Randall to have ever been born, which is quite an ask for Jamie, considering that he has been put through hell and tortured and violated by this man and is still like trying to really overcome the emotional and mental trauma of what happened in book one. So it's a really big ask. Yes, she's just asking don't kill him now, like give it a year. But like, I, it was uncomfortable. I, I mean, I get where Claire is coming from, but I also am like, of all the things to ask of this man, like that had to be the thing you ask. So it was a really uncomfortable and painful scene because you can, you like see how upset Jamie is by this whole thing. But yeah, it was, that was rough. Things are starting to pick up now. Cause as I said, really it's just a waiting game at this point because it is a waiting game for Jamie and Claire too. Like they're trying to figure out what Bonnie Prince Charlie is trying to do. And like nothing has been set in motion per se that they know of. But yeah, there have also been some really comical moments. I think my most, I think the most comical one at this point is Jamie having been to a brothel and coming back with a sex toy of sorts. So, <laughs> so there was that. It's been interesting. I do appreciate the humor every once in a while because some of it can be really heavy. There has been some sexual violence. There's just been some violence in general. Um, so trigger warning for all of those types of things, but yeah, that's kind of, kind of where things stand. Um, so yeah. Good morning. So yeah, <laughs> I'm, I just finished reading this morning. I'm still kind of processing everything, but I take back what I said about nothing happening in this book. Like I said it yesterday and then the moment I said it everything started to happen and the last like 100 to 150 pages of this book so much has happened there have been so many emotions that I am still trying to process. It, like so much happened that if you look at where I like flagged things, like I haven't flagged anything in probably a hundred pages because I was just so into what was happening. And like those pages were turning so fast, you probably couldn't even see them. Um, I was, I was cruising. I was in a good reading spot this morning, but yeah. I, as I said, still processing all these feelings. Um, so I think as I mentioned yesterday, like we know that Jack Randall's back um, and I had all sorts of feelings on Claire making Jamie promise not to kill Jack Randall yet. Um, and those feelings are still, uh, still there. Still there for a lot of reasons. There were a couple like really emotionally raw moments here. Um, I think the first was, I would say, right when Jamie and Claire are having this conversation um, about like why Jamie has decided he's not going to kill Jack Randall yet. Um, so he's kind of put that stipulation, like he'll give it a year so that the Frank Randall line can exist, essentially, um, but we don't really, I didn't personally understand why Jamie would have gone along with it. I know they have this relationship that's built on trust and honesty and all of that, like that's part of who they are as a couple 
and they would both gladly die for one another. So when you look at it like that, like, okay, he's he's willing to lay down his life for Claire, so yes, he would obviously make this choice um, when it comes to Jack Randall and Frank for Claire. But like when Jamie actually gives his reasoning for it, I kind of melted. Like, there was something very romantic about it, but also something really, really sad about it, because essentially he says that he's not not killing Jack Randall for Claire. He's basically ensuring that Frank exists because he is concerned that if something were to happen to him, like, she needs somewhere to go. And so he makes her promise that if something were to happen to him, that she would go back to Frank, which means that she goes to the future. And obviously this book starts with Claire being in her present in the 1960s and having returned to Frank after being with Jamie for several years. So yet you know something happens, which we're all banking on Culloden still happening. Um, even though, like, Jamie and Claire are doing all this thwarting of things. Like, there's something that's coming, we know it, we feel it, we know that Claire goes back. So, it was just like, like, it was a moment in the book that I got a little misty, because his logic is so selfless. But also at the same time, I'm like, Jamie, can you not just, can you not be a good guy for once and just, like, off him for me because I would really really like that. Um, I mean Jack Randall as a character is probably one of the vilest characters that I've ever read and it's like he keeps one-upping himself like constantly, periodically. He just continues to do things that are vile and disgusting and make him such a villain. Like not even just an antagonist, like the Comte in this that basically is pissed off at Claire for losing um, one of his ships is like just an antagonist. Like he's a nag. He bothers you. He like, uh, yeah, he, he tried to kill you a couple times, but he's just an antagonist. Like at some point you figure he's gonna go away. Jack doesn't. Jack is like some incurable disease. I would love Jamie to off him. Like at any point. I know he made this promise to Claire, but I'm okay with him breaking it. Like, I'm really, I would be okay with it. So yeah, and then I think I get my wish, right? So during the course of these pages, like, I think I'm gonna get my wish. I think Jamie's gonna off him because all of a sudden, Jamie has challenged Jack Randall to a duel. And we're kind of only getting bits and pieces through the gossip mill of the royal court that Claire and Jamie have ensconced themselves in. Claire is freaking out because she's thinking that Jamie is breaking this promise to her, and I'm thinking Jamie is breaking this promise to her, and Claire is furious and upset and panicky and trying, as Claire does, to stop things from happening. Meanwhile, I'm over here being like, yes, Jamie, like, do this. I don't care about Frank. Like, get your, like, give Jack Randall his due. Like, let's do this. Let's off him. Um, <laughs> so basically, Claire is like the angel on his shoulder and I'm like the devil on Jamie's shoulder in, in my mind. That's how, how this situation is working. But yeah, so you start to get these clearer pictures of exactly why Jamie has broken his promise and challenged Jack Randall to a duel and it has to do with little Fergus, who is such a troublemaker, but like Jamie and Claire are both protective of him, so you start to understand that and Claire understands it and that kind of diffuses some of her anger because she is just disgusted and hurt and now understands. Um, although I don't think that needed to have been the case. Like you should have understood because of what Jamie went through already. But fine Claire, fine. Like you you can see I'm still I'm team Jamie in this case. Like 
Claire, you are a bonehead. Um, but yeah, so Jamie does it to protect an innocent child. And you then realize that he didn't actually technically break his promise to Claire. So he wounds Jack Randall fairly seriously, um, but he's not dead. And that's all that Claire is concerned with until Jamie kind of implies that he might have taken a sword to a vital organ that is required to have children. And so he's fairly certain that he has ended that line of the family tree, which means that Frank would not exist, but he hasn't broken his promise. Like, considering he was in the heat of the moment in battle, props to Jamie for having that kind of forethought. But yeah, so there's still the concern that Frank might not now exist, and Claire is realizing that she might never know whether or not Frank comes into existence because obviously she's in the past and her kind which someone explained this to me she thinks if she still has his gold wedding ring on her finger like if that's still there that Frank must still exist like she's so is she thinking that if he no longer exists that it's like just going to vanish and that she's not going to have any memories of Frank at all because all of that will vanish because he just doesn't exist. Like, I'm, I'm trying to understand her thought process here, but the presence of that ring on her finger seems very important to her as like a temperature check or a reality check to say, no, Frank's still okay. So I don't know, I don't know how, like, is that her logic? But yeah, there was a lot, but I am now, how far am I into this book? I don't even know. I'm like 530 pages into this, and part five is called I Come Home, and chapter 30, which is the first chapter, is called Lollybrook. So we know that Jamie and Claire are going back to Scotland. So yeah, I have a lot of reading to do. I take it back. Things happen lots of things happen and I feel like it's just gonna get more and more intense as I get closer to the end of this book. So I'm Team Jamie in this case. Claire Frazier, don't be a dingus. That's all I have to say. <laughs> all right, I'll talk to you later. Bye. Hello, good morning. I hope you're well. Apologies for looking a bit like a wet rat this morning, but I literally just stepped out of the shower. I did read this morning, so I just finished part five and we'll be starting part six of Dragonfly and Amber. Jamie and Claire are back in Scotland, which does my heart good. Outlander kind of helped to cement Scotland's special place in my heart. Like after reading Outlander, the first book, it was part of the reason I ended up going to Scotland several years ago and I just fell in love with the country, the people, the culture. It's somewhere that I would love to live at some point in my life. I call it my like soul country because I really just felt connected to the land, the people, just basically everything about it. So it's very nice to be back there. Um, and there's something really nice about seeing Claire and Jamie back home where Jamie is an, an outlaw and where he's back at Lollybrook and he's kind of living this perfect pastoral life with his wife and his sister who he loves and his brother-in-law who's like a dear childhood friend and it's just sweet but obviously we know like paradise isn't gonna last because if that were the case there would not be another like 350 pages of the book to read so it's a nice kind of like calm before the storm type situation that we all know is coming and damn you bonnie prince charlie damn you to hell it's one thing when jamie and claire put themselves in danger like they make that choice you don't always approve of it, but 
you accept it. It's an entirely different thing with when this like ignoramus of a prince decides, I'm just gonna sign Jamie's name to this document and make him a traitor to the English crown. Like, what? Like, how can you be... I don't even know. It's just like the thoughtlessness, the arrogance, the gall. Bonnie Prince Charlie is on my shit list right now um, because literally Jamie just got his pardon so that he wouldn't be hanged for returning home and Charlie puts his name on this thing where he's trying to claim his right to the throne and basically that means that if the rebellion fails Jamie is a traitor, which means that he would not only be hanged this time, he would be hung, drawn, and quartered. I mean, we know Jamie and Claire get into danger all the time. Like, this book series would not be nine books long and counting if that weren't the case. But still, still, I, yeah, so you see I feel some ways about Bonnie Prince Charlie right now um but yeah so the goal but I don't, yeah I'm, I'm still processing I'm still processing my anger at a historical figure in a fictional accounting so yeah I'm gonna go now because I have a little time before work so I want to see if I can schedule tomorrow's video which is my anticipated releases for Q2 which you will have seen by the time this goes up. And maybe I'll try to read a little bit more doubtful, but we'll see. And I'll talk to you guys later. I was today's years old when Diana Gabaldon announced that the ninth book in the Outlander series has a pub date, November 23rd of 2021. And not only does it have a pub date, it also has a cover. So, the, like, I'm, I'm excited, but the game is now on. I have to read six books and about 300 pages that I have left in Dragonfly and Amber by November 23rd, but I was right. She finished the book, like, literally a couple of weeks ago, and I... I knew that they were going to have a pub date. I knew that they were going to like fast track this thing. So I feel validated. Now I'm really flustered and really just want to sit and read all day, but I do have to go to work and I really didn't read all that much this morning. I think I read like 25-30 pages because I got sucked into an art heist documentary that I just couldn't put down and now I'm like okay, I need to finish this book like tomorrow so that I can start book three. That's not gonna happen. But I just had to come in, tell you guys the exciting news because I literally just saw it pop up on Twitter and then on some news articles. So needed to share that. I'm gonna go work now. I'll talk to you later. Hello, good morning, happy Friday. So checking in with a reading update since I didn't actually give much of one yesterday? Was it yesterday? Yes, it was yesterday. Um, because I was way too shook by the news that the ninth book in the Outlander series has a pub date and a cover, which means that I have roughly seven months and six days to finish book two, which I only have about 200 pages left of, so I should finish that in the next couple of days, and then read the other six books that have already been published in the series. So the heat is on, my friends. The heat is on. Um, but as far as reading goes, I'm still in part six, which actually seems to be like a fairly big chunk of the book, um, because I think I still have like another 150 or so pages in this section. And I've been reading it for a while, but it's basically the Jacobite Rebellion. Like, we're on the campaign, we've witnessed a battle in all its blood, guts, and glory. Red Jamie kicking butt on the battlefield. We've had Claire being a badass, saving people's lives. Um, and it's been good, 
but if you are squeamish at all probably not for you. It's all really interesting because I feel like we're now kind of in the nitty-gritty of the history of what happened. So these are actual battlefields and things that took place in history with these fictional characters kind of plunked right smack dab in the middle of it and they're obviously trying to change history. Which brings me to this like interesting thought. Like can you actually change history? Which I mean I guess is the crux of this entire series. Like Claire is in there trying to prevent this Jacobite rebellion right now. Um, and as far as I know, she doesn't because we know that the Battle of Culloden happened. It hasn't happened yet in the book, but it's coming. And so if she wasn't able to prevent that, it's possible to say that she hasn't really changed the like grand scheme of things because everything that she knows that happens to the Highlanders do actually happen to the Highlanders. Can you change history? I don't know. I don't think so. It's just, it's just been a wild ride so far. At Culloden hasn't happened yet and I'm waiting for it. Like there are only 200 pages left so I know it's coming and so I know that's when the ugly tears are gonna start. Like I'm I feel like I'm building it up and I'm gonna be really upset <laughs> if it's not as sad and devastating as I've thought it would be, but I'm pretty sure I'm gonna ugly sob. But yeah, that's that's kind of where things are. As I said, I have like 200 pages left to read, so not a long way to go. I'm pretty confident in being able to finish this book over the weekend. So yeah, but since I don't really have anything else to share with you, I'm gonna go because I do need to get some work done this morning. And yeah, I will check in with you guys in a little bit. Have a great day! Bye! This is where I would insert the meme. We did it! We did it, Joe! Because I finished Dragonfly and Amber this morning and oh my word, I actually needed to take a minute. So I took a shower because all of the emotions, the heartache, the hope, the shock, the like literally I went through a spectrum of emotions this morning and it blows my mind that obviously you know what is coming you know that Claire goes back through the stones from the jump like we know this from page one of the book and yet when Jamie sends Claire through the stones I was an emotional wreck I ugly sobbed, like tears, snotty nose, the works. I could not stop myself. Even though I knew this was coming, even though I expected it, I, whew, oh, that was, that was, that was rough, man. That was, that was emotional devastation, Diana Gabaldon. You murdered me this morning and you know what I'm okay with it because it was beautiful and emotional and I am a sucker for the books that make me cry so yeah I mean I don't know what else to say I was just an emotional wreck and then you're back with Claire in 1968 where she's telling Brianna and Roger about Jamie and Brianna is pissed, man, and Roger believes her, and just like everything that happens at the end of the book, 
I'm st I'm still shook because it was in a way like a lot of things were tied up neatly with a bow as you would expect at the conclusion of a book but then there are also all these questions that are still left unanswered and it's because obviously this is book two in a series so you end in a cliffhanger and I'm stoked that I don't have to wait for this book to be published because it's on my shelf so I know what I'm reading in May for sure um, but yeah it it did a lot in a very small amount of time like considering this book is over 900 pages long like everything that f happened kind of in the last 200 pages or so was just emotionally gripping like a true page turner of a book. I'm still kind of trying to decide between a four and a five because as far as being like a book that wrecked me emotionally, it did that in it gave me everything about Claire and Jamie from book one that I loved. It gave me the history of the Jacobite Rebellion, which I'm fascinated by. Um, so part of me is leaning very heavily towards a five star rating for this. But then there was also like stuff that I wish had been done a little better. I think the main thing is because the, their world is expanding, you're meeting a larger cast of characters now. People, I call them kind of whack-a-mole moments where people from book one or even just early in book two are popping up again, or you're meeting new faces who I suspect will play larger roles in the rest of the series. You're meeting all these people. And in some cases, those like supporting characters don't feel as fully developed as I would like. Sometimes they feel a bit more like caricatures or they're just a little bit flat and I would love to see them developed more fully. I think the two characters that I'm thinking of in particular are Fergus and Myrta and I don't know if that's just like me being biased because obviously I know those characters from the TV show and I'm very attached to the characters in the TV show so maybe it wouldn't have bothered me as much if I hadn't seen the TV show first. So that's why I'm kind of like maybe a four? I don't know. Um, We'll see. I guess I'll, I'll make a decision at some point. But yeah, I, I loved it. It's Claire and Jamie. They are my OTP. There is a lot of sex. I will say that, but it is a romance. So I expect that. It's also like a 950 page romance. So I would expect, expect quite a bit of it to happen. Um, but yeah, it was just a wild ride. I am still shook. I don't know what star rating I'm going to give it. 4, 4.5, 5. One of those. I know that. Thank you so much for watching this vlog. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, be sure to give it a thumbs up, comment, and subscribe. And if you've made it this far into the video, please leave the Scottish flag emoji. How about that? Um, and I will talk to you next time. Bye!